Hello, so today I'm going to discuss uh, chapter six of Lola Olafemi's book, Feminism Interrupted, Disrupting Power, and chapter six is called Art for Art's Sake. So I'll share my screen and my PowerPoint slides, which I will post online so you can see them. And the lecture will be about art, but it will also touch on British cultural studies. And I will discuss Olafemi and, and the book, and I will also discuss uh, Olafemi's book, and I will also discuss the work of uh, British Marxist cultural theorist, Stuart Hall, who was a Black British Marxist. And uh, one of the most widely cited scholars in post-colonial studies. So firstly, I will discuss art, activism, and imagination, drawing on Lola Femi's uh, writings regarding art and activism. Lola Olafemi discusses the work of Mona Hatoum, who is a British Palestinian artist. In 1985, Mona Hatoum walks the streets of Brixton barefoot with Doc Martens wrapped around her ankles. She places one foot in front of the other decisively for an hour. Her performance is captured and edited into a six minute color video. Roadworks is born. As a member of the Brixton Art Collective, her piece makes a powerful intervention in public space, a space defined by police brutality, the ritual of stop and search, and the infrastructure of impoverishment imposed on communities from above. Her performance piece gets beyond the limits of the gallery space, takes art outside through the puddles that litter the streets. The boots tightly wrapped around her ankles signify mechanisms of state control. The boots were worn by violently, violently racist skinheads and the police. Atum invites the audience to make the connection. So this is all from chapter six of Lola Olafemi's text. Um, and hopefully you have a chance to read it. And it is one of the topics of the presentation you could choose from. You could choose to do a presentation about Olafemi's uh, text. And you could also choose to do a, a final creative piece uh, for the final project that touches on Olafemi's writings about art and activism. So Lola Olafemi discusses um, some of the fundamental tensions regarding art. And I think art could be broadly defined to also look at worlds of music and fashion. Um, and the essential question uh, or the essential, I guess, discussion that the book stages in this chapter is on the one hand that art allows people to comment on politics in really subversive ways and to also reimagine uh, social relations and class antagonism. However, the art world is often a very elitist set of spaces and Olafemi discusses the ways that working class women um, working class women of color, new immigrant women and poor women, uh, and also LGBTQ people who don't have access to a lot of financial resources um, are often excluded from the art world. And uh, in the context of uh, Canada or Turtle Island, um, Indigenous women and two-spirit people uh, are often the most economically disenfranchised. So the art world is often not something that people can access. Um, however, Lola Olafemi is still optimistic about what art can do if people can gain access to um, space to make artistic work, and if people have the confidence and self-esteem to make artistic work. She writes, visual 
art, painting, sculpture, photography, and literature provide a space for us to test our limits. There are mediums for meditation and reflection. Art moves us because it provokes feelings and calls for a response. Whether that response is repulsion, fear, joy, appreciation, or boredom, all art calls for a witness. Perhaps it is the same desire to witness that is the driving force behind the work of feminist activists. As feminists, we are moved by injustice in the world. We work because what is happening around us demands a response. Our responses are varied and aren't limited to the sphere of the political. We do a disservice to the power of art and artistic creation when we assume that it is less important than political intervention. Likewise, we do a disservice when we assume that art alone can liberate us. So art alone obviously cannot liberate people from class structure because of how deeply embedded uh, the art world um, is in the worlds of consumer capitalism and uh, aggressive capitalist competition. Um, however, Olafemi also argues that artistic creation is not less important than political intervention um, because it can change the ways that we think about aesthetics. And even the kind of artwork that enters the worlds of com commercial fashion and music videos, film, can change what we see as uh, normal in terms of images. There has been a lot of... Um, interesting queer and transgender and, and feminist art uh, that has allowed us to think of the body and aesthetics in different ways. Creativity, writes Olafemi, is at the heart of any new world we seek to build. Without the demand placed on our body by capital, by gender, and by race, we could be freed up to read, write, and to create. Alongside political freedom comes an escape from the social conditioning that deadens our creativity. Every time we engage our creative faculties, we are going against a logic that places work and the nuclear family at the center of our existence. So this idea of work and the nuclear family as being at the center of existence and being more important than one's personal freedom is something that Lola Olafemi's book asks us to question. So being a perfect mother or wife or worker um, all involve a sense of biopolitical vitality uh, that inculcate the subject into a set of state norms um, that govern people and that restrict people um, in accordance with their productive and reproductive capacity, which will support um, conservative, conservative aims of the state. So in his writings regarding biopolitics, Michel Foucault discusses the way that the state intervenes in all aspects of life. So nutritional warnings on food, um, collection of statistics regarding who has children when, uh, collection of statistics regarding age are really about the ways that the state is constantly intervening in our lives to make sure that we are good citizens and good workers to produce future citizens who will also be good workers. Um, Jack Halberstam or Jay Halberstam uh, is a transgender theorist who is, yes, referred to as Jack Halberstam, um, known also as Judith Halberstam, is an American academic and author, best known for his book, Female Masculinity, and also for a book called The Queer Art of Failure, which looks at the ways that art involves failing. And it often involves 
failing to live up to people's gendered expectations, and failing to live up to the expectations of a productive workforce, and even failing to live up to uh, expectations placed on people to be a perfect worker who makes enough to buy suburban property and have children. And this is the unfortunate truth about the lives of people who make art and engage in creative production, and also the lives of people who are engaged in political activism, that many people are not necessarily going to make a lot of money, and they might not make a lot of the kind of money that is required to have a, a perfect family and to own property. So art is threatening because when produced under the right conditions, it cannot be controlled. But gatekeepers and cultural institutions have written women, especially Black women, outside of the history of artistic creation and freedom. And so what I would argue from a feminist perspective and from a queer and feminist perspective and an anti-racist feminist perspective is that many people of color are often taught to overperform certain normative roles to uh, draw attention away from our relationship to poor people in poor countries. So, uh, and to also draw attention away from the history of colonialism, the transatlantic slave trade. So being someone who is not at all creative, who works a very normative set of jobs or who has a very normative career, who helps people make money um, or who helps people conform in certain ways becomes the role of what many Asian American theorists have called the model minority. And the model minority is someone who doesn't complain about racial discrimination. They're also not someone who is connected to the struggles of people in the global South. And they're often someone who works in a very conformist role and who also looks aesthetically the same as everyone else and who also conforms in terms of having a straight uh, family and a straight cisgender identity. So I would argue that um, this history then of keeping Black women out of creative industries is firstly about economics, that a lot of art industries involve asking artists to pay expensive fees to have art shows, also art schools, which are very expensive. Um, but I also think it is about this sense of wanting people of color to conform, to overcompensate for histories of colonial rule, histories of political revolt, and difference aesthetically from white norms. So Olafemi states that art has the ability to escape the conditions of its creation, the context and motivations it arises from. In many ways, that is a core part of the feminist project, escaping the naming of your body, your personhood, disrupting the inevitability of violence. We are always trying to escape the conditions of our lives, and there is no doubt that artistic practice helps us do this. But when we imply that the sole purpose of art is helping rediscover a shared humanity or a way of feeling that is not dependent on time, location, and all of the other market markers that organize our lives, we blunt the knife that might tear might help us tear these markers down. This idea of blunting the knife is also one of the reasons that I think that many people fear Black female artists. Um, Asada Shakur was a member of the Black Panthers. Angela Davis was a member of the Black Panthers and is now a professor in the history of consciousness. Many Black women's activism has really threatened um, the obscene forms of exploitation that Americans have been involved in uh, during the transatlantic slave trade and onwards during the Iraq war. Um, there are countless examples of Black women whose activism has not only challenged uh, the violence of American capitalism, but uh, the violence of America's global human rights 
abuses. So Alice Walker is another great example. Um, Alice Walker wrote a book called The Color Purple, which was about slavery. Um, and Alice Walker has also been uh, an impassioned advocate for the rights of Palestinians. So Overcoming Speechlessness is Alice Walker's book uh, about the horrors in Rwanda, Eastern Congo and Palestine and Israel. And uh, Alice Walker travels extensively to write this book and to be uh, an ally in struggles, an ally for uh, the people of the global South uh, who are struggling against poverty and war or against the effects of poverty and war. Art is best utilized as a weapon, writes Lola Olafemi, our writing back as evidence that we were here. Apolitical approaches or approaches that seek to deaden the resistance potential of artistic practice are merely another mechanism through which the status quo is reproduced. So apolitical approaches or approaches that seek to deaden the resistant potential of artistic practice are often at first saleable. So things that one makes at first that involve conformity can be saleable. The problem is, is that over time, um, endless forms of repetition are not even necessarily saleable and often can bore people. Um, and so art is also a really interesting thing because on the one hand, one could argue that because a lot of art galleries and art schools are often uh, places and spaces that are occupied by middle-class people, um, and many countries in the global south uh, have not had a comprehensive arts education. And it's only been recently um, that people have entered art schools in say countries like India or Pakistan. Like there is an arts tradition, but it hasn't necessarily been connected to the global arts market. Like there are schools in India that are really well known for painting or even painting traditional Indian arts, um, but it has, Historically, and even now, uh, a lot of art worlds are often very expensive places to access. If you're an artist, you are often asked to pay fees to even show your artwork, or you're paid very small amounts of money. So it tends to be middle class people. But the problem is, over time, is that when you reproduce the status quo over and over again, it starts to bore people. And so uh, it is much more lucrative, obviously, to make challenging work. If we want art that reflects the true complexity of our lives, writes Ol Lola Olafemi, and the range of human emotion, then we must eradicate the harmful conditions in which we live. As much as artists may run away from the political underpinnings of their work, it haunts them. Art is powerful, but it is not powerful enough to undo centuries of colonial domination or climate catastrophe. It is only as effective as we allow it to be. We give art its agency and healing ability. We enable it to speak to the painful, shameful, and most delicate aspects of our lives. That is a responsibility, one that we all have a role in upholding. So 
So Lola Olafemi also discusses the relationship between art and feeling. The specificity of artistic creation, she writes, reveals something about the injustice that is deeply embedded in the way we live. It is also a lifeline for others who are attempting to journey through a world characterized by oppression, art that grapples with and documents survival, as well as contributing to movements that seek to make the world more just, can propose revolutionary ideas. When women and non-binary people make art with the intention, the intention of raising consciousness, they are not only contributing to the feminist fight, they are demonstrating that feeling is a way of knowing and a powerful starting point for building a political framework. Affect, the ability to be moved, should never be underestimated. It is what brings us to feminist politics and what sustains us. Feminist art is moralizing and instructive because this is necessary ammunition when our lives are on the line. It helps us clarify our position and make sense of what it is we are imagining. When we engage in political work, we do so for every artist that cannot become an artist because they are black, poor, uneducated, disabled, trans, because structural barriers mean that their lives are already mapped out for them. We use art to fight political battles in order to create the conditions for unbridled creativity so that we might all be able to live artistic lives, lives of freedom. Many Black women artists and writers have used their voices as artists and writers, um, not just for all, their own personal gain or celebrity, but to bear witness to the injustices that we uh, live with and all participate in as consumers. In the book, Overcoming Speechlessness, a poet encounters the horror in Rwanda, Eastern Congo, and Palestine, Israel. Alice Walker writes of her personal encounter with the cruelty and horror in Rwanda, Eastern Congo, and Palestine slash Israel. Through her work with Women for Women International and Code Pink, and finding her voice again after a period of speechlessness. Bearing witness to a range of depravity, Walker presents the stories of the individuals who have crossed her path and shares their tales of suffering and courage. Self-imposed silence has slowed global response to those suffering. And in this book, Alice Walker aims to redress the balance. So there are many other examples of prominent black feminist artists whose work really touches on injustice and also uh, historical wrongs that have led to economic inequality. And one of the most prominent examples is Carl Walker. And so this is a clip about Kara Walker, whose drawings and installation work often touches on the politics of race and gender. And I think asks us to think about very basic questions regarding fairness and justice. The only phone with audio magic eraser. Google Pixel 8. There's a lot of attention that gets paid to sort of the external part of one's existence, you know, being Black, being a woman, being an American. Being, there's the quality of just being. being a body so overburdened with history and ideas about identity, shoulds and shouldn'ts and abuses is sort of rending away with 
identity from body. That is a recurring question. Part of my upbringing and my personality has been don't never let them see you sweat. And this is, you know, from the perspective of, you know, being black in America, you might be talking to somebody who will kill you. You might be talking to somebody who doesn't see you as a human. You might be talking to somebody who, yeah, who somehow is psychically destroying you as you speak. To show so much self revelation of many selves that are bumping up against the burdens of being a black woman in America. And the black hole is what remains. There's archetypes, and those archetypes have materialized in American culture in stereotypical depictions. And those stereotypical depictions means that the humanity of people who are Black and women who get slaughtered into kind of pen is very difficult to escape. In a way, these drawings represent for me this attempt to go back in time and to sort of retrace my steps. I think in the hope of maybe ask others to help me in that process. What what is it? Not necessarily what am I, but what are, are all of these aspects of culture that have produced this being or this monster? I think drawing wise process is the, the one thing that provides an element of pleasure. <laughs> you know, and it's, it almost feels perverse to enact that, but it's it is joyful and there's always a conflict for me and that the conflict gets resolved when I actually just go ahead and do it. So like how I am I am all of this. I am all of this and sometimes more. You know. Obsessive and all consuming the thing that, that binds you to coming back again and again to making these gestures of art or of drawing. And you think that this time will open up the door to understanding, but it just opens another door and another door and another door. The challenging thing about making drawings or doing any art or even making big monumental pieces is that you begin to believe that you can make anything happen, affect a, a heart, and then stepping back and seeing this war that seems to live in the, in the heart of the, the beast, you know, in the heart of America. That is the sort of essential tension present in the world, you know, the sort of seeking for solace and for resolutions and for joy and happiness and then the sort of like persistent uh reminders that it is not to be yours <laughs> not to be had that that is uh that sounds terrible <laughs> that doesn't sound terrible i should draw and talk at the same time So the next part of the lecture, I'll discuss theories of representation by Stuart Hall. And when we think about art and aesthetics and artistic work, I think that 
it's important to look at cultural studies and the ways that cultural studies and Marxist cultural studies has conceived of images and aesthetics, not as having a mimetic relationship to reality, but as having, uh, as being highly constructed um, and imbued with ideological meaning. So cultural theorist Stuart Hall offers an extended meditation on on representation, moving beyond the accuracy or inaccuracy of specific representations, Hall argues that the process process of representation itself continues the very world it aims to represent and explores how the shared language of a culture, its signs and images provides a conceptual roadmap that gives meaning to the world rather than simply reflecting it. Hall's concern throughout is the centrality of culture to the shaping of our collective perceptions and how the dynamics of media representation reproduce forms of symbolic power. So Hall was interested in hegemony and the ways that uh, hegemonic meanings are made. So hegemony uh, is a Marxist concept and hegemony is defined as having a preponderant influence or authority. Um, hegemony is defined as pre pre preponderant or dominant influence. The important thing that we want to tease out of this definition is that something is hegemonic if it has more influence or power than other possibilities. Hegemony then gives a more complex way of talking about something you are probably already familiar with, Marx's notion of ideology. Karl Marx wrote a great deal about ideology and class relations, and according to Marx, the ideas of the ruling class are in every epoch the ruling ideas. The class, which is the ruling material force of society, is at the same time its ruling intellectual force. So Marx's approach clearly defines ideology as something that is oppressive and can only be escaped through the dialectics of capitalism. The ideology of Marx in Marxism then uh, doesn't acknowledge or give much credence to the existence of other cultures or ideologies, but the idea of hegemony does. Rather than a single ruling ideology, the idea of hegemony recognizes that there are many possible cultures that vary by time and circumstance. This idea of hegemony allows us to see ideology as active. It opens the door for us to see cultures in conflict, vying for position and influence. So a principal method through which dominant groups elicit the subordinates' cooperation is by co-opting their lived experiences. It works primarily by inserting the subordinate class into the key institutions and structures which support the power and social authority of the dominant order. It is, above all, in these structures and relations that a subordinate class lives its subordination. And chapter five of Olafemi's book discusses Muslim women and the ways that Muslim women are often never people who speak for themselves and are always spoken for and about. And this is a way in which... Uh, a subordinate group is constantly spoken about and inserted into the fantasies um, of a dominant group and inserted into power structures in which a dominant group has the right to make authorial claims over a subordinate group through doing research, um, through narratives, uh, through documentary photography. Um, there is always this sense that people have authority over somebody and authority over their image and their story and uh, even their own lived experience. Because the oppressed must work and have much of their existence within organizations and structures controlled by the elite, they must adapt to the expectation and ideas of the hegemonic culture. So one of the reasons that I think that the university system is so racist and sexist and heterosexist and transphobic and xenophobic is because of this idea of authorial claims. Um, subordinate groups must be inserted into the fantasies that dominant groups have about them in order uh, for the university to produce um, affluent, privileged, white, cis het people who can speak on behalf of and for others. And this is also true of people in the global north who write narratives about people in the global south. Um, and this allows people to uh, 
insert subordinate groups into their existing theoretical frameworks, narratives, and fantasies, um, and into their own ideas of aesthetic choice and beauty and normativity. It also allows people in positions of power to make money from uh, the exploitation of others. So Stuart Hall was interested in signs and semiotics. One of the chief methods that cultural studies uses to understand culture is semiotics. Semiotics is simply the study of signs or words. When semiotics is applied to cultural, cultural generally, semiotics is a way of understanding culture as if it were language. For example, a semiotic analysis of the images in a magazine ad would look at the different images as if they were words or signs. We're going to review some of the ideas from semiotics as we do. We'll be talking about signs and language, but keep in mind that cultural studies maintains that various cultural objects such as pictures and symbols can be read in the same way. Semiotics began with the work of Ferdinand de Saussure. Sassur argued that language is a system of signs in which all terms are interrelated and achieve their value only from the simulation's presence of all other terms. The most defining feature of a sign, then, is its opposition to other signs. Linguistic elements are given meaning through their structural relations. Ultimately, then, signs themselves are not important, for it is the relationship among the signs that creates and limits meaning. So another semiologist, Roland Barthes, explains that cultural signs, symbols, and images can have both denotative and connotative functions. Denotative, denotative, denotative functions are the direct meanings of a sign. They are the kind of thing you can look up in an or, ordinary dictionary. Yet cultural signs and images can also have secondary or connotative meanings. These meanings get attached to the original word and create other wider fields of meaning. At times, these wider fields of meaning can act like myths, creating hidden meanings behind the most more apparent. Thus, systems of connotation can link ideological messages to more primary denotative meanings. In cultural oppression, then, the dominant group represents the subjugated in such a way that negative connotative meanings and myths are produced. This kind of complex layering of ideological meanings is why members of a disenfranchised group can simultaneously be proud and ashamed of their heritage. As an example, thinking about the Black office colleagues to whom Dubois referred, they can be proud of being Black, at the same time feel that an image is too Black. Even though we've been talking mostly about words and language, remember that cultural studies uses semiotics as a method of understanding all culture, not just language. So Hall was interested in the ways that a sign is made up of both a concept and an image or a concept and a word. And signs come to signify something, but the sign itself can never wholly have a mimetic or mirroring relationship to the idea. So if we were to think about love, the word love means many things in different languages. There are lots of other different words for love in other languages. The ways we signify love through um, pictures or through drawings or through photos or through films is obviously um, something that changes over time. Um, and changes because of concept. So there is always this gap in the way that we come to represent something or someone or an idea and the form, form that representation takes. And this gap between, say, an idea of love and the words we use and the images we use is often highly contested. And it's highly contested uh, for Stuart Hall because of hegemony and the ways that the ruling class often has control over what love is. Another good example is beauty. So um, the hegemonic 
ideals of beauty are obviously controlled by the ruling class and by uh, a ruling class of, say, white, middle class, or rich, cisgender, heterosexual people who have control over this ideal of beauty. And what happens for Hall is, is that all these other subaltern groups, queer people, trans people, Black people, Muslims, people of color, and obviously poor people and working class people are always trying to contest this meaning um, and contest the hegemonic meaning of something like beauty. And this contestation is about who can be a great artist or a model or a cultural producer and who can make money in these interest, industries as much as it is it. it as it is about who can be seen to be beautiful or attractive or desirable. And in its most extreme, who can have a family, who can have children. So Hall sees representation as an act of reconstruction rather than reflection. And this reconstruction is about reconstructing um, ideals, uh, as a form of subversion on the part of the working class. So almost every image in a technologically advanced society is created for a reason with some other or larger purpose in mind. There is then the surface appearance or denotative meaning of the image, but there is also a deeper myth-like connotation there as well. So the denotative meaning is just what the image or word means. And the connotative meaning is what the word or image connotes, the deeper meaning. So the idea of representation is a way of critically understanding culture that is used, usually focused on single images. The idea of discourse, however, is generally used to critique larger swaths of culture. A discourse for Hall is a group of statements which provide a language for talking about a way of representing a particular kind of knowledge about a topic. Discourses are produced through language and practices. They are ways of talking about and acting towards an idea or a group of people. One of the most powerful insights concerning discourses is that anyone deploying a discourse must position themselves as if it were the subject of a discourse. So a discourse then is a group of statements which provides a language for talking about or a way of representing a particular kind of knowledge about a topic. Um, so if we were to think about the kind of discourse that is produced about art or aesthetics, we could talk about a group of statements in which um, someone is trying to produce the best work, the most saleable work, the most uh, well-liked aesthetics. But we could also talk about political artwork that is defying a set of norms and that is exposing a set of truths that might be unpopular truths. So Hall was also interested in meaning and struggle. Generally, the dominant definition of a word, it's taken for grantedness is achieved as powerful individuals or groups give credibility to the association of sign and meaning. And as an association is repeated by others over time as in the medium. These repeated meanings become part of the sedimented memory of a collective and form, form form a reservoir of themes and premises from which participants may draw. One of the things we mean when we say that the meanings are sedimented is that they are taken for granted. We use them without ever thinking. Thus, taken for grantedness is part of what makes signs, symbols, and culture in general ideological. According to Hall, there is a way in which culture becomes a dead language when it is taken for granted. Unless we are intentionally taking a critical stand when we talk and act, we are unknowingly reproducing discourses of oppression. And it's the taking for grantedness of culture that makes it appear natural or real. But when a sign or image becomes part of a conflictual discourse, Paul considers it part of the living social intelligibility. That part of culture that becomes alive. 
But if the sign is withdrawn from conflict, it simply becomes part of the taken for granted association between, between meanings and signs, which in Hall's way of thinking constitutes an ideology. Thus, a culture is most alive when it is the subject of conflict. So when meaning is simply taken for granted and is not in conflict, then culture is not really alive. The meaning we ascribe um, to something like beauty, uh, what signs we associate with that word, um, what this word means to different people is highly contested. And that means our culture is alive. And it also means that we have a culture of democracy and free speech where we can debate these ideas. Conflict over the meaning of a sign or a discourse is most likely to occur during times of problematized meanings. Meanings become problematized through unexpected events, events that break the social frame, when powerful interests are involved or when a striking ideological conflict becomes apparent. The social struggle may be manifest in two ways, disarticulation slash or conflict over the meaning of signification production. So finally, I'll finish by discussing this idea that Stuart Hall had about reversing stereotypes. Many times uh, when we think about stereotypes, we're often thinking about reversing these stereotypes. So taking a negative uh, image of, say, women or queer people or people of color and reversing the stereotype with a positive stereotype. So Hall challenges this idea by stating that to reverse the stereotype is not necessarily to overturn or subvert it. Escaping the grip of one stereotypical extreme, Blacks are poor, or child's childish, subservient, always shown as servants, everlasting, good, in menial, men menial positions, differential to whites, never the heroes, cut out of the glamour the pleasure, the reward, sexual and financial, may simply mean being trapped in its stereotypical other. Blacks are motivated by money, love, uh, bossing white people around, perpetuate violence and crime as effectively as the next person, are bad, walk off, off with the goodies, indulge in drugs, crime and promiscuous sex, come on like super spades and always get away with it. This may be an advance on the former list and is certainly a welcome change, but it has not escaped the contradiction of the structure the structure of stereotyping. And the model minority is a good example that the model minority who is uh, someone who works in the financial district, a medical doctor, an engineer, is simply a reversal of the stereotype of someone who is not a full citizen, who has overstayed their visa, um, who will never be part of a global north country or modern modern democratic culture. And so Hall was interested in how rather than reversing these stereotypes, um, we can actually create artistic work and acts of writing that challenge the terms of representation themselves, the ways that we think in very simplistic binaries. So the second strategy for contesting this regime of, of, of representation is the attempt to substitute a range of positive images of Black people, Black life, and culture for the negative imagery which continues to dominate popular representation. This approach has the advantage of writing the balance. It is underpinned by an acceptance, indeed a celebration of difference. It inverts the binary opposition, privileging the subordinate term, sometimes reading the negative positively. Black is beautiful. It tries to construct the positive identification with what has been objected. It greatly expands the range of rep the range of representations and the complexity of what it means to be black thus challenging the reductionism of early stereotypes. Much of the work of contemporary Black artists falls into this category. However, Paul is still critical of this idea of positive 
ideas of blackness or positive depictions of blackness. It greatly expands the range of racial presentations and the complexity of what it means to be black, thus challenging the reductionism of earlier stereotypes. However, once strategies of cultural representation or artistic work or writing is still framed as a response to racism. The third counter strategy locates itself within the complexities and ambivalences of representation itself and tries to contest it from within. It is more concerned with the forms forms of racial representation than with introducing a new content. It accepts and works with the shifting, unstable character of meaning and enters, as it were, into a struggle over representation while acknowledging that since meanings can never be finally fixed, there can never be any, any final victories. And thus, instead of avoiding the black body because it has been so caught up in the complexities of power and subordination within within representation, the strategy positively takes the body as the principal site of its representational strategies, attempting to make the stereotypes work against themselves. Instead of avoiding, avoiding the dangerous terrain opened up by the interweaving of race, gender, and sexuality, it deliberately contests the dominant gendered and, and sexual definitions of difference by working on black sexuality. So I'll finish by showing this clip of a film by Stuart Hall called The Stuart Hall Project. When I was about 19 or 20, Miles Davis put his finger on my soul. The various movements of Miles Davis matched the evolution of my own feelings. There continued to be a regret for the loss of a life which I might have lived but didn't live. As we slide out of the 1980s, who's going to define the cultural themes of the next 10 years? No one on the British left thinks harder about this question than Stuart Hall. Tell me why have they all come to this country? It's not long ago, you were bombing in Kosovo. Now, this is a long-term result of that situation. But I don't know how you could describe the people as bogus. Accommodation and adjustment between Blacks and whites is on the agenda. But when I ask anybody where they're from, I expect nowadays to be told an extremely long story. <laughs> But I think identity is an endless, ever unfinished conversation. We always supposed really something would give us a definition of who we really were, our class position or our national position or our geographic origins or where our grandparents came from. And I don't think any one thing any longer will tell us who we are. Okay, so that is the class uh, for this week. And I hope you're enjoying Lola Olafemi's book, Feminism Interrupted. Feminism Interrupted, Disrupting Power. Thank you, and I hope you're doing well. Cheers. <laughs>